I took 120 milligrams of melatonin every night for a week. That's about 100 times higher than a normal dose for sleep. Why? Because there's fascinating research showing that when melatonin is taken at very high doses, 10, 100, even 3000 milligrams, it acts as a powerful antioxidant and anti-inflammatory compound that could play a role in longevity. In this video, I'll share exactly what happened and what the science says about high dose melatonin. Okay, so what did I experience? To be honest, when I was going into this experiment, then I thought I'm gonna feel very groggy and tired in the morning after taking 120 milligrams melatonin. In the past, I've taken 10 milligrams or slightly higher, and that already made me feel quite tired and lethargic in the morning. But surprisingly, I didn't feel tired in the morning after taking 120 milligrams, which is the complete opposite of what I was expecting. The biggest thing I noticed was that I woke up at 4 a.m. every night, which is also quite surprising. When I opened my eyes, then I checked the clock, it was 4 a.m., and I felt like I just slept 8 hours straight, but in reality, I slept only 6 hours. Now, I can't say it was 100% because of the melatonin, but uh, it wouldn't have been a placebo effect either because I thought the melatonin would make me feel more tired rather than untired. Maybe one theory is that the high antioxidant effect of melatonin in large doses eliminated my sleep pressure or lowered my sleep pressure, so I felt more refreshed and more recovered with less sleep. That's one theory. But melatonin also has a lot of individual effects. Everyone reacts very differently to melatonin. Some people have lower doses causing them grogginess, other people get grogginess from higher doses. I got the grogginess from 10 milligrams, but I didn't get it from 120 milligrams. So that was a kind of positive surprising effect that I didn't expect. I was able to sleep shorter and feel as recovered as I slept 7 to 8 hours. One big side effect I did notice during the daytime was I was getting some mild minor headache that lasted for a few hours during the daytime and I was also maybe a bit more irritated, which is very surprising because I'm usually not irritated at all, like I never get irritated, I never get angry or anything like that, and I never get a headache either. So there was something specific in the melatonin that was causing me a small headache and made me a bit more irritated. Maybe the irritation came from the small headache, but regardless, I did get a very small, a minor headache for a few hours during the daytime. All right, now let's talk about the research on this megadose, or much rather gigadose melatonin. Russell Reiter, PhD, has been pioneering this melatonin research for decades, and he's still doing research in his 80s. He's written extensive papers on the antioxidant and anti-inflammatory effects of melatonin. Mechanistically, melatonin inhibits cancer in multiple stages by preventing mutations and actively killing cancer cells via pro-oxidant effects in tumor cells. So it has selective antioxidant effects in healthy cells and pro-oxidant effects in tumor cells. Melatonin also enhances sensitivity to other cancer therapies and protects against radiation. But is it safe? There's a large 2021 meta-analysis of 79 clinical trials on over 3,800 participants and they used melatonin from 10 milligrams all the way up to 3,000 milligrams. They found that there were limited adverse effects reported and melatonin had a generally good safety profile. Overall, the study saw better sleep regulation in dementia patients and anti-amyloid and neuroprotective effects, which might be useful for neurodegenerative diseases. Melatonin combined with chemotherapy in cancer patients was seen to improve the tolerability of chemo and had possible anti-tumor effects. The patients also had less anorexia and less fatigue. In heart disease patients, melatonin lowered blood pressure, improved cholesterol, and lowered inflammation markers. In COVID-19 patients, melatonin had immunomodulatory and anti-inflammatory effects, which might support the immune system during sickness, but there isn't enough research on that yet. 11 studies out of these 79 studies specifically used a dose of 100 mg up to 3000 mg. In this 2020 study, healthy males between age 25 to 35 were given 100 mg of melatonin 1 to 2 hours before exposure to radiation, and as a result of that, they saw less DNA damage. In a 2018 clinical trial, infertile men with varicose seals, which is a condition of enlarged veins in the scrotum that impairs blood flow to the testicles, went through a surgical procedure that removed those enlarged veins. After the surgery, some of them were given 400 mg of melatonin daily, and after three months, sperm parameters like sperm concentration, motility, and proportions were significantly better than the placebo group. The melatonin group actually had lower total sperm count on average before the surgery, but after receiving the melatonin, they had significantly higher sperm count. So melatonin protects the sperm. A 2025 study on older people from age 55 to 98 with comorbidities saw that melatonin at a dose of 40 to 200 milligrams was seen to improve sleep as well as hypertension, ischemic heart disease, and diabetes. 
In this 2017 clinical trial on women transitioning through menopause, six months of 2 grams of myonositol plus 3,000 milligrams of melatonin per day improved glucose metabolism significantly, whereas myonositol alone improved only thyroid functioning. A 1991 study on women saw that both 2.5 and 1,000 milligrams of melatonin enhanced luteinizing hormone pulse amplitude, which means that diurnal surges in luteinizing hormone were larger. Luteinizing hormone is a precursor to sex hormones, and it contradicts the idea that melatonin lowers testosterone or estrogen. Another 1993 study in young men saw that melatonin didn't lower testosterone or luteinizing hormone either. However, melatonin does raise growth hormone. A 1987 study saw that 500 mg of melatonin after 45 minutes rose growth hormone by 222%. That's because melatonin inhibits somatostatin, also known as growth hormone inhibiting hormone. But you don't need to take 500 milligrams to raise growth hormone. A previous study saw that 5 milligrams already increased growth hormone by 160%. Lastly, a 2011 study on liver operation patients saw that 50 mg per kilogram of melatonin, which for a 70 kg person was 3,500 mg, accelerated recovery from the ICU and lowered liver enzymes, compared to placebo. This means they had reduced liver injury and faster recovery from the surgery. So overall, there is quite interesting research about gigadosing melatonin, but we definitely need more clinical trials on this. Fortunately, there's also research on slightly smaller dose melatonin, which, you know, 10 milligrams sounds a lot compared to 1 milligram, but 10 milligrams is a lot smaller than 100 or 3000 milligrams. Research on 10 mg melatonin shows improvements in lipids and lower inflammation, and we have plenty of clinical trials on that topic. The majority of people don't need to take 100 mg of melatonin, and they probably shouldn't. For sleep, a dose of 1 to 3 mg is already enough, and if you want to improve inflammation markers or your cholesterol profile or lipids and blood sugar, then 10 mg already does the job. 100 mg or more might be only useful in certain medical conditions. A common question is that, isn't this going to suppress your natural melatonin production? Maybe 1 mg isn't gonna do it, but 100 mg is definitely gonna do it, right? Well, research on doses of 50 mg has shown that it does not suppress natural melatonin production, but 50 mg is half the dose of what I took. However, a study on 100 mg of melatonin also saw no suppression of natural melatonin production. So there's nothing to really worry about in terms of natural melatonin production. Melatonin doesn't work like testosterone. There's no negative feedback loop. Melatonin is mostly regulated by the day and night cycles, light exposure, food intake, etc. Melatonin levels decline with age significantly, and there's research that high-dose melatonin could help to fix some of that by improving circadian regulation of cortisol, which also declines with age. What's clear is that as you get older, your body produces less melatonin, which is bad for your sleep, and also bad for your overall inflammation status. So elderly people might benefit from larger dose melatonin, maybe not 100 milligrams, but potentially 10 milligrams. Another issue with oral melatonin is that the bioavailability is around 15%. It means that when I was taking 120 milligrams, I only absorbed around 18 milligrams. If you take 10 milligrams, you absorb 1.5 milligrams. The 18 milligrams is still significantly higher than what your body would produce naturally. And the 15% of 10 milligrams, 1.5 milligrams is closer to what your body would produce naturally. So it highlights the importance that if you are supplementing oral melatonin, you actually need a higher dose than you think. One milligram melatonin will give you actually very little amount of melatonin. All right, so what's the main takeaway? Megadosing and gigadosing melatonin is a very interesting research topic, and I hope that we get more clinical trials on this in various health conditions. For me, I had unexpected results. I didn't see any grogginess or tiredness the next day when I was taking 120 mg melatonin. I actually had shorter sleep, and I felt more recovered and refreshed from that shorter sleep. However, I did notice a headache that lasted for a few hours. So I'm not going to be taking 120 or 100 mg melatonin on a regular basis for that reason. Overall, I think melatonin is a god-tier supplement for all the research that I mentioned in this video. I ranked 100 supplements in general from worst to best. Check out the video for all the other supplements next.